In East and Central Africa today, there is a great need for temporary professional and technical assistance. And it is here that CUSO has one of its largest programs. Technical and tradespeople are needed for both practical work and training positions. There is an increased emphasis on rural and resource development. Medical and health personnel continue to be in great demand. And in the field of education, CUSO still provides a large number of teachers for a variety of institutions. Botswana is generally a very dry country. In the west, is the famous Kalahari Desert. It is quite an enormous country, and it seems even more enormous when you consider that there are only 620,000 people, and it is larger than France. Shashi River School is in Tanota Village, which is in the northeast of Botswana. At present, it has approximately 600 students. 450 of whom are academic students. The remaining 150 are brigade students. These brigade students are what in North America might be called vocational students. I was hired, or I was sent to Africa, to Shashi River School to teach English, math, and development studies, the three subjects that are given the brigades in their academic section. It is a course which has a great deal of economics in it, some economic history, particularly the agricultural and indu industrial revolutions, a short piece on politics, some comparative government. Generally, it is a course which is intended to uh, increase the critical ability of the students, to give the students the tools with which to constructively criticize development trends, not only in their own country, but in others as well. And there have been many encouraging signs that this is being realized. The carpenters at Shashi and elsewhere spend 80% of their time doing technical work and 20% in the classroom. This 80% of the time occupied in technical work consists of training and productive work. Once they have finished, they write a government trade test. Uh, the success rate has been very high indeed, with less than 1% failure. The situation for the builders is much the same. They also spend 80% of their time here doing practical work, either being trained in it or actually producing something. Each group of 15 boys has its own instructor, and an attempt has been made to keep the, the ratio no higher than that, to provide the students with an adequate training. Unlike the carpenters, the builders do not write a trade test. But the builders nevertheless have little difficulty getting a job again because of the great deal of construction currently going on in Botswana. <laughs> the third group of 
brigade students we have at Shashu's are textile workers and textile girls. The weavers spend their time making mostly handbags, shoulder bags for women, P some place knots, some rugs, and some a few large bedspreads. The tie dyers spend most of their time dyeing bleached material and sewing it together either in dresses or shirts or else just sending the tie-dyed bolts away to be sold. The uh, retail outlet for all of these goods from the textile workshop is the Botswana Craft a government retail set up to market all of these goods. The demand is so high that everything that the textile workshop can produce is sold without any trouble at all. The biggest difficulty with the farmers is that because of traditional attitudes, the local committees which are responsible for allocating land are very reluctant to give boys or young men of this age land. We have gotten around that here at Shashi by placing the first graduating group on a 10-acre plot within the school property. They are set up on a cooperative basis. The uh, capital financing money has come from Canada through CUSO from CEDA. It looks very good indeed for these boys because their training has been good. The technical advice, if needed, will come from a man who is an instructor on the school's farm. And above all, the boys are very enthusiastic about the project. An integral part of development studies is what we call development practicals. These are done only by the academic students, not by the brigade students. One sees frequently that the academic students look down upon brigade-type endeavors because you get your hands dirty, as, as cliched as that. Besides development practicals, which are intended to impress upon the students the necessity of hard even, and very frequently physical work in developing a country, we also have voluntary work on Saturday mornings, which is truly voluntary. There is no coercion or compulsion for the students to participate in this. Although Malawi is quite small, it has a great variety of scenery and nearly every few miles the scenery changes so that a day's drive anywhere produces the equivalent of a complete drive across Canada in terms of variety. Uh, nearly every mountain is unique in its features and its shape and we never get tired of just driving around any part of the country. My job is based with the Ministry of Health in Blantyre, Malawi, and although it's a government project, it's actually funded by three or four different groups. The Christian Service Committee, which is a group of all the churches in Malawi, have contributed some running costs and vehicles, and CUSO has agreed to provide the cost of all the new staff which we're providing for our upgraded health units.
We also received some equipment and other assistance from UNICEF. The basic concept of the job is to upgrade a series of rural health units. Most of the present health units are very old, being built 20 to 30 years ago. They are run by one medical assistant who sees on the average eight to 10,000 persons every month, which means two to 300 patients every day. They do this on a limited supply of drugs and usually without any supervision or moral support. At most of the units, we have been constructing some new buildings to upgrade the level of care. The money for the actual buildings has come from Oxfam. The Christian Service Committee in Malawi has supplied a building team, and the local people themselves provide bricks, sand, and some labor. One of the important stages is meeting with the local headmen, the chiefs, the leaders of the local political party, and soliciting their cooperation from the very beginning. When the buildings are completed, we usually have another meeting, bringing together the, the village headmen, the head women, and the local political leaders, and explain to them the purpose of the new clinics which we hope to establish. When the nature of a clinic has been properly explained to the people and to their leaders, the response has been almost overwhelming. In some cases, we've seen up to five and six hundred children within the first week. Manjamo. Manjamo. Three mornings a week, I teach the student medical assistants at the large central hospital in Blantyre. Many of my medical assistants can list off all the bones and muscles in the body and yet can't deal with the basic problem of teaching a mother how to feed her child when it has diarrhea or has stomach problems. My main problem is teaching them how to look at a situation, analyze a answer that's relevant to the surroundings and to act on that. The second main aspect of the upgrading and training is to give the staff some supervision, continuing education and moral support. This is where my job comes in on a most regular basis. Many of these medical assistants have been working 15, 20 years in one health unit and have been visited half a dozen times by a doctor. Just by getting out, even on a monthly basis, spending an hour or two with them, asking them their problems, seeing some of their difficult cases with them, I'm able to accomplish a great deal in boosting their morale, increasing their clinical knowledge, and helping them to evaluate what they're doing and to work most effectively in giving the health care. One of our main programs we're stressing, of course, is the under five clinic. In the past, too many sick children were brought to the dispensary. Um, they were treated for their immediate problem, being pneumonia or measles or a sore throat, and sent home. Two or three weeks later, they would be back with the same problem. It's sort of like trying to dig a hole in sand. You keep digging and the sand keeps falling in faster than you can dig. The only solution is to keep the sand from falling into the hole in the first place. The main thing we want to do is teach the mothers to understand why the children are getting the diseases. If they can understand this, they can prevent 90% of the diseases themselves. My wife Elaine didn't have any specific job lined up when she came. However, being a nurse, she soon found herself involved in many projects and comes out with me several mornings a week and helps with the under five clinics or the antenatal clinics and generally works with the nurses or midwives at the health units.
We particularly enjoy the weekends because there's so much to see and do around Malawi. There are dozens of beautiful mountains within 20 or 30 miles of Blantyre. Most of these are excellent for climbing, several you can drive up on, and a lot of them have rivers, waterfalls, and streams which are great for swimming and hiking. Tanzania is one of the most beautiful parts of the world, I think. We have Mount Kilimanjaro to climb, we have Mount Meru to climb. We have five game parks in very close proximity. It is impossible to get the feeling of African animals without visiting them in the wild in this way. And for biologists especially, it's an experience that could never be equaled, I'm sure, anywhere else in the world. I am working at the Forestry Training Institute at Homotoni, which is 10 miles outside of Arusha. The basis of my work is to upgrade and uh, redefine the training program for beekeeping in Tanzania and to initiate a long-term research program. Beekeeping in Tanzania probably goes back to the time of the cavemen. After all, East Africa is considered to be one of the areas where men originally evolved, and it's certainly one of the first areas where bees evolved. So the two have been together almost as far back as we can see in history. and. Uh, no doubt man has been harvesting honey for almost as long. So there is no problem in developing beekeeping in the country to get people interested in it. One of our problems is dealing with students who are the products of an education system left over from the colonial era. Education in many African countries has become simply a way of moving up the ladder so that one no longer has to work. So one of the most important parts of the program is to spend time with the students out doing practical work. But we try to make sure that the students spend as many hours as possible simply working with bees, getting to know bees, getting to like bees, getting to think like bees. The Tanzanian instructors are not themselves of a level of training equal to the level that they are trying to create. This means that it is necessary to create a good level of training for me to help each one upgrade his course. This way each lecturer becomes a specialist in one or two subjects spends a lot of time on the books creating the courses, spends a lot of time with me discussing the curriculum, uh, because many things don't exist in textbooks. They spend a lot of time with my journals. And in this way, each of the lecturers can contribute their part of the overall training program, which will result in a group of students with a higher level of training than any of the individual lecturers have. There is so much nectar in it that some of it is just flowing, you can see. See, there is lots of nectar just coming down. Tanzania and Chizurisana, Yajurikana, Mokote, Africa, Inabadari, Piwanda, Namidi, Mwenyeji, Wake, Tuna, Nikonia, Tanzania, Tayari, Kabisa, Ujenga, Chiko, Research on the African bee is one of the most exciting frontiers of research in the world today. There are probably more members of this particular bee than there are of any other bee in the world, and it will certainly become the center of a very important beekeeping
fishing industry. And yet very, very little is known about it, except that it is extremely mean and difficult to deal with. Now, there had been records earlier, and I've been able to verify them, of a much milder tempered bee that lives at high altitudes on Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Meru. I have observed this bee, and uh, indeed it is very mild, so the plans are to try to capture this bee, to bring it down to the research station, and to try through a directed breeding program to make the African bee, or a particular strain of African bee, much more easier to deal with and much more friendly to the beekeeper so that modern management techniques will be much easier to develop. The products of the hive in Tanzania are all quite important. Beeswax is a very special export product in that it is one of the very, very few export products of developing countries. Its price has actually gone up in the last 25 years and not gone down. Honey is the traditional food for most tribes in Tanzania, and it is also used for making local beer or pombe. I am trying to develop a recipe for honey wine that will allow a high quality product to be made in Tanzania and compete with their grape wine industry and perhaps become another export product. My coming to uh, East Africa is a paradise compared to Fort Churchill, Manitoba. Uh, I have been uh, stationed at Fort Churchill for a period of 13 years. Also, I was at Eskimo Point, Rankin Inlet, uh, pretty well all over the northern part of Manitoba, northern Ontario, and the isolated territory. So coming to uh, East Africa was uh, just another posting to me. Uh, my duties here, I'm the officer in charge of the workshop, also uh, responsible for ordering repairs for upcountry, uh, also keeping our stock level in our stores, and supervising and training of mechanics, which are all African uh, employees except Ed Tingley. I have uh, quite a bit of paperwork. That's something I, ne I never did agree with. Uh, we, me and paperwork don't get along too well in telephones and radios. If I can dodge them, I do, but uh, most of the time somebody catches me and I have to perform on them. And then, of course, the radio bugs you all the time. You, you just get doing something and somebody's broken down somewhere or they're out of fuel, there's no money or something and they need your help right away. So uh, you madly try and take some action on it. No coffee breaks in bush clearing. I like mostly about my job uh, here in uh, Namalari that uh, I am succeeding in uh, getting several of the employees their mechanical certificate, which uh, in turn will help them greatly in, in making their living. When I came here, there was no organization. 
uh, the shop was not equipped, the machinery was standing, and uh, we dug in and uh, made a special effort, and today I would say we are 90% operational. I believe that a lot of people get rooted in, as I might say, to a certain job and routine, and uh, this they don't want to change. I, I would advise them to just pick up stakes and come on over to East Africa for, for two years with QSO. I personally hate the thought of leaving Olmatone uh, for several years. I would like to stay here until I can uh, be sure that when I leave, the program I have started will have a number of trained Tanzanians who can continue it completely. Well, one of the main reasons I joined CUSO was the fact that I found medical practice in Canada rather boring. I really couldn't see myself doing anything except getting older and richer. I seem to be sitting in the office all day looking after healthy people or people with personal problems rather than medical problems. It's an in incredibly revealing place to be in Botswana, especially for a Canadian because everything is nice and easy back home where he doesn't have to really look hard at what is going on around him. I think that when I do return to Canada, I shall be much better equipped. I shall be much more confident of my treatment of whatever circumstances I face there.